by a executive assuming the role is called a surrogate court. And so in that court, uh, any beneficiary has no standing. In fact, a beneficiary under probate really only has a standing in a, in a court of, of equity. The concept of equity that used to be, well, still is associated with chancery is used to describe those courts where a beneficiary does have standing. But within a probate court administered by the presumed executor, it is really uh, the court of the trustees. Now, how do we correct the record of this will and testament? And we did describe last week how lawyers are trained to ensure that we do write our will, but in writing our will, we never make clear the rules of administration. We make clear potentially who is going to be the executor. We make clear potentially the claims of right of property, but usually limited without extending it into untraced property that should have been entitled to us at the greater estate. And we obviously nominate the beneficiaries. Well, one of the things the system keeps trying to convince us and does very well is putting form over substance. That is, seeing the paperwork as being the penultimate truth and that the intent isn't effective until the form complies. This is what I was saying about the ecclesiastical deed poll. If intent is true, and intent is true in law, and certainly before the divine, intent is true. If your intent is clear, then that is what should warrant. But in their system, they say, oh, no, unless the document states will and testament, it is invalid. Here is a classic example where they place form over substance. Well, let me show you an absurdity of that and to show you how simple it is to express your will. If you go and have a look at the opening lines of the Ecclesiastical Deed Poll, you see the words expressed in trust. Well, how do I create a trust? Simple. I express it. I say I express in trust. If I define the elements of the trust, I define the intent, I define the res, I define the parties, I have created the trust and I can speak that trust into existence. In fact, if you want to know how simple it is to create a trust, I could say to you, you ask me, can I borrow your car? I say, yes, you can borrow my car. Here are the keys. Just don't crash it and please bring it back in a couple of days. We have created a trust. Define the res, define the terms, express the intent. Now in court, and they can't avoid this, and they would love to avoid this, they would love to end this, but the essential nature of law is and has always been that it is spoken. The vocalised intent is what is the law and the paper is the memorialization. But to them, paper becomes everything. And that is what they want to convince us. Why? If we ever realize that when we stand true in court, clearly, just focusing on knowing who and what we are, then our voice is the law. The vocal is the law. The paper is merely the memorialization. And, and creating a trust is simple by saying, expressing trust, bang, bang, bang. So what is the simplest example of expressing our will? Well, it is saying, it is my will. You want to prove you have a will? Say, it is my will. And then whatever the intent is, you have now expressed your will. It is that simple. Now, because we are dealing with tricky people, because we're dealing with people that have been brought up on this absurd and perverse philosophy of legal realism, which means that they are not taught history. They are not taught the principles of their own law. They are ignorant. They are lazy. They are arrogant. 
doesn't mean that they are necessarily bad people, but they are lazy, ignorant, and arrogant. We need to accept the fact that in these courts, simply by expressing it may not be enough. This is why we need to consider conforming in part to the forms that at least appear to be provided in statute, which is why we we are talking about completing a will and testament. Now, in terms of notes, and you've heard me speak about notes in the last few weeks, there is a series of notes and provisional remedies listed on one hyphen heaven. I have mentioned that we're updating those and we're going to move those to a series of court sites. You can find those court sites now by going and looking at the list of websites from the homepage of university.ukadia.info. What we're doing is we will be introducing on the court sites, because the Eucadia court sites is where we'd like to help and want to help each and every one of you start to record remedy. Remedy that makes uh, any course of action you take far, far stronger when you're dealing with their courts. So through that, part of that remedy will be to provide templates in terms of will and testament. And what the will and testament, once it is uh, done and recorded, recorded as a, a deed in their system, is that it, it then means that you have recorded and executed your will and testament, you have proven form. Then all you need to do is have some form of deed, some form of affidavit that has been notarized and itself entered into the public record as proof. And then that becomes the document best entered into uh, a court. Now, just as there has been the ongoing and seeming never-ending discussion on birth certificates saying, oh, it's valuable, it's valuable, there's been a lot of discussion in terms of approaching the court and uh, presenting yourself in court and proving the role of being the executor of the estate. And when we say we are the executor or the occupying the office of the general executor of the estate, uh, we're talking about the entire estate, not simply uh, the partial estate. When we've said that, one of the things I want to mention now, because it is important, if you don't provide public record and proof prior to arriving to court, and then you go to court to state that you are the executor. The reaction of the judge, which will be one of shock, horror, and probably anger, and and may well involve the judge moving the bailiffs and sheriffs to your side to arrest you, is not because the judge themselves is, is... necessarily an evil person, a bad person. But what you have done is you have challenged the judge in that court to be the executive of some tort, to be a usurper, to be a criminal. Now, it may well be that we find ourselves in the middle of a court action where we have no choice. We may find that we are going to court tomorrow We may even find that we've done everything possible and they still haven't read our documents. But what I hope we will be able to do, hope you will be able to do, is give the opportunity to the clerk, give the opportunity especially to the judge to know that when you go to court, you will be standing there as the executor and if he or she should approach this in the typical manner of presuming executor, there is but one role they are then assuming to be and that is the false executor, the executor som taught. Give them the opportunity to cure with honour. And if they don't take it and you've made it clear then you have done everything possible. I raise this because there is an element 
there is always an element when people start to get runs on the board, and you will have heard, heard, you will have heard that people are getting runs on the board, and there'll be more and more cases of remedy where people say, these people took my home, they took my house, they took my car, and there's almost an aspect of revenge, almost an aspect of glee. When you go to court, when you go to court with knowledge that you've gained on the law and you represent the law and you represent the role of being an executor, you have an obligation not to injure the law. You have an obligation to be better than their behaviour. Not to curse them, not to behave like the very worst of them. The role of executor is an enormous obligation and challenge. You want to know a classic example of an executor? If you were brought up a Christian and you believe the words of Yeshua, Jesus, because that's what a Christian is. A Christian is someone that believes the words of Jesus above all others. You can't be a Christian if you don't believe that. A Christian that is, is one that believes that. Jesus was a classic example of an executor. It is a difficult role. It's a role of teacher. It's a role of trying to guide people. Socrates was an example of an executor, someone that, that sought to help the trustees achieve their own, object, uh, achieve their own job, direct them, but, but see that they show some self-responsibility. It is a difficult role. It is a thankless task. You have to be better than the people you're facing. You can't go down to the trenches. They may talk over you. They may yell. They may not follow their own rules. That doesn't give you the excuse to do the same. Executive dresses properly. And an executive shows manners. An executive doesn't swear and curse as much as an executive would like to swear and curse. An executor is a pillar of society. An executor is an embodiment of the law. An executor reads the information on the canons and understands the importance of restoring the law. An executor teaches by example. If you struggle with those things, if you go to this with the aim of revenge, if you go to this with the aim of saying, Stuff the system. I want to do what I want. I want to live the way I want. And they've all been terrible to me. And I'm going to exact my pound of flesh. Then you are not ready to be an executor. You're not. And that behavior will cloud your action. And that behavior will put you in a position where the system has no choice but for its own survival to jump on you. And it will. It is a difficult role, an extremely difficult role, because it requires us to grow up. It requires us to end our previous prejudices. It requires us to show a level of intellect and care for something seemingly esoteric as the law, something that is as, as delicate as justice for our community. It requires us to be true leaders and heroes and not simply people out for revenge, not simply a, a, a lynch mob out for its, its blood because of everything they've done to us. So I make those points because if there is one thing that saddens me when I see the knowledge that's being shared is this underlying feeling that people have that that when they see the success, that this is the opportunity to exact their revenge or that this is the opportunity to make themselves rich. If you approach this on the, on the belief that somehow you're going to find a magic formula to suddenly become rich overnight, then you're suffering the same illness of the people in power. None of this is about being rich. If it is about retaining the energy that is rightfully yours, yes. If it is about protecting your community and growing your community 
The answer is yes. 